So the question that I will um, try to address today will be whether one could uh, measure signatures of uh, many body localization in solid state experiments. And for those of you that uh, have heard of this topic before, you might think that this sounds crazy because of the coupling to phonons, which will thermalize potentially disordered um, electronic degrees of freedom. So to put us all on the same page, I'll make a short introduction to many body localization. So this can be seen as a generalization of Anderson localization to uh, interacting system. So it happens in systems in the presence of interaction and disorder. But unlike um, Anderson localization, so this MBL localization happens um, already in 1D only at sufficiently strong disorder. Um, so therefore one observes a transition between a system behaving as ergodic versus localized at a critical disorder strength. And what's kind of peculiar about this transition is that um, unlike other transitions, one can observe it even at infinite temperature since the nature of eigenstates changes throughout the whole spectrum. And one property uh, that will be crucial for uh, my talk is that uh, while on the ergodic side, there is one, maybe two conservation laws like Hamiltonian and uh, magnetization or particle number, on the MBL side, there is actually macroscopically many um, local conservation laws that uh, can be for the case when we have in mind disorder spin chain, seen as dressed uh, sigma Z operators. And uh, since Hamiltonian is diagonal in terms of the, those operators, and since we have uh, kind of macroscopically many, they imply, and because they are localized in space, they imply that there is no transport and again, at any, um, any uh, temperature or energy density, which is a, a very spectacular property as well. But the problem is that such an insulator cannot be realized in solids because of the coupling to phonon bath, which essentially kind of connects these different local degrees of freedom. And that's certainly uh, bad news. Um, it's turned out that um, it's actually not so easy to study it uh, numerically. So somehow tensor network techniques sort of have difficulties because um, of the volume law nature of eigenstates on their ergodic side. So that it's kind of difficult to go across the transition because of uh, that uh, property. Then if one looks at the transport properties, system is diffusive deep in the uh, ergodic phase but it becomes sub-diffusive um, with an increasing and eventually diverging dynamical exponent as one increases the disorder. And therefore it's difficult to, to discern it from, from just case with no transport. And that's why most of the studies have focused or, on using exact organization and looking at uh, spectral properties of such a system. Um, yeah, so spectral properties and properties of eigenstates. But what we've sort of learned in the last year is that um, this has severe limitations as well, because essentially before hitting the transition, one actually hits the level spacing. So um, it's, again, uh, very difficult to, to conclude um, anything from there. So people have started asking whether we can actually uh, examine this uh, transition numerically. And situation is not much better, I mean, if one takes the pessimist point of view, it's not much better on the, uh, on the experimental side because uh, of this limitation that one can only study closed system. That's why people um, kind of demonstrated uh, signatures of MBL using cold atoms or trapped ions, which are closed at least up to some time when one starts to lose atoms, but can trap a relatively a finite or small number of particles, again, for a finite time. Um, and going into the thermodynamic limit would be much easier with the solid state material. But again, the problem there is that one has this coupling to phonons, which breaks the localization and mediates transport. And what um, we find that it's a real uh, game changer in such a setup of disordered system that's coupled to bath is applying uh, a weak drive. And um, 
and look at the steady state that is stabilized in such a case. So somehow similar, uh, Martin already touched a bit on this uh, topic. What we find here is that on the ergodic side, the steady state that is stabilized is approximately thermal, while um, in the MBL side, it is very non-thermal. And that is a consequence of the fact that on the ergodic side, I have let's say, only one approximate conservation law, while on the other MBL side, I have uh, macroscopically many. So to get an intuition why I get an ergodic state on the therm uh, a thermal state on the ergodic side, one can think of a, a greenhouse. Because also there, uh, this is a system with one approximate conservation law, energy, um, and contact to the environment through windows and a uh, drive from, from the sun. And we all know that the state that is stabilized is a thermal one with a temperature that is essentially determined by one rate equation for energy. Now, when I have more conservation laws, like on the MBL side, I sort of, now I don't have only one rate equation, but macroscopically many. So, and uh, I also need more parameters to characterize the steady state that is stabilized. And uh, kind of, uh, and, and yeah, the study say that will satisfy all these rate equations will not be a thermal one. And that's what kind of what we expect and look for is this, this difference in stabilized steady state. And since we already know that on the ergodic side, we're expecting a, th a thermal one, um, a very natural uh, way to characterize the difference between the two is to look at the local temperatures which should not vary on the ergodic side and should vary very strongly on the MBL side. And okay, now let's us do something concretely. So we consider here, um, it's essentially disordered spins, but written in spinless fermions language um, that are coupled to, let's say, 3D acoustic phonons at a fixed temperature. And this coupling itself will cause a decay of all these approximate conservation laws to a thermal state at the rate that is given by the strength of the coupling to phonons. Now, when I add a drive, for example, kind of shining a, a light, white light to the system, or shining, like, shining with, with, a, with a light bulb, um, I add the source term. And now uh, the solution to, to all these rate equations will be a non-trivial one. And uh, yeah, so what we are interested in is like calculating the steady state in that case. And um, somehow similarly as, as before it was believed that the um, phase transition can be only detected in purely closed system, uh, I claim that it can be also detected in the case when I take these couplings to phonons and drive uh, to be infinitesimally small. And that is what I will first consider. So I'll consider the density matrix in this limit, for which I know that it has to be diagonal with respect to the fermionic Hamiltonian. And then I essentially, instead of rate equations for the conservation loss, I look at the rate equations for these weights here. I calculate them and obtain the steady state. But kind of now that the important observable that I look at are uh, these already mentioned local temperatures. And here is precisely what I've kind of expected. So if the disorder is weak, so weak that I would be on the essentially ergodic uh, side of the phase transition, they vary um, very weakly, or the, the profile is essentially homogeneous or almost homogeneous, while on the MBL side, they vary like crazy because I stabilize this very non-thermal steady state. Uh, and now kind of one can get bolder and sort of propose an order parameter, which is the variation of these local temperatures over the mean. And um, unlike other order parameters or that people proposed before, again, based on the eigenstates, of the system, this one is at least a bit more experimentally friendly because it could be in principle obtained by a local Raman spectroscopy in a disordered system, uh, the disordered material, which is weakly driven by light. And these local temperatures could be obtained by measuring, for example, Stokes and anti-Stokes peaks uh, with a local uh, Raman spectroscopy. While in theory, we measure it by essentially simulating a thermometer. So we locally couple the systems to some external 
bosons and determine and, and then vary this temperature until we reach the point that there is no heat uh, current flowing through this link. Um, but yeah, so in the thermodynamic limit, I really expect that these variations on the ergodic side are zero because really in this limit of infinitesimal couplings there, the steady state is the right expansion point while they are of order one on the MBL side. Uh, of course, because there's a, and I have to do exact organization to obtain these weights, I, I can only consider small system sizes where, where this order parameter uh, yeah, becomes, I mean, when I see a crossover instead of the transition. But nonetheless, uh, even when I look at, at how um, this temperature goes to zero as one increases the system size, the nice information is that it actually goes down exponentially. So this will be different system sizes, which gives us a way to determine the correlation length. Uh, uh, that, uh, when we plot it here, grows upon uh, uh, approaching to the transition. But because from, our, um, from this data, we have no means to determine the, the critical disorder. And since we know that the one from the uh, exact organization is essentially trouble, I mean, it's too small, there's no real reason to, to take this critical exponent too seriously. But, I mean, so far I've described this kind of, um, um, I mean, so this ideal limit of taking perturbations to zero, while in experiments, I will always have finite coupling uh, to the phonons, which has to be compensated with final, finite drive. So what's really irrelevant for the experiment is, is finite uh, couplings to the environment, which can be controlled by the phonon temperature and intensity of the uh, light source. And the idea is that now um, somehow similarly as in zero temperature phase transitions, I can tune this, uh, where I tune the temperature in order to learn about the, the, the underlying uh, phase transition, Similar, I can here tune the, um, the strength of coupling to the environment in order to, to learn about the underlying MBL transition. And this has also a numerical advantage because um, it's known that the finite coupling to the environment um, kind of uh, limits the amount of entanglement that can build in such a system. So now I know that I can use tensor networks to go essentially across the phase transition since uh, a bond dimension will be kind of con naturally controlled by the strength of coupling to the environment. Um, and, but yeah, before we really go into this microscopic calculation, I would like to um, kind of discuss what can we learn analytically about what, how, uh, what uh, dependence on this coupling to the environment we expect. So the thing is easier on the ergodic side where I know that energy is the only approximate conservation law. So what I would like to, and I know that the temperatures kind of vary uh, around the mean uh, value. So what I can write down is essentially a hydrodynamic theory that uses the energy continuity equation that is supplemented by sinks and sorts due to the coupling to the phonons and the drive. And these are weakly uh, mo modulated in space because of the underlying disorder in the system. And what I get is that in such, uh, so that these fluctuations will scale as the coupling strength to the environment to the dimension over four. Um, that's kind of just an analytical result. Um, but what I've assumed here is that I have a diffusive system, while in reality, as I'm approaching the MBL transition, the system becomes subdiffusive with a growing dynamical exponent and kind of one heuristic way to take this into account uh, is just to kind of replace nabla square with nabla z, where z will be now two, the dynamical exponent will be two in the diffusive case and will be larger in the subdiffusive case. And then kind of what we get that these dimen this, uh, fluctuations in temperatures should uh, scale uh, with epsilon to the power that is proportional to the inverse of the dynamical exponent. I agree that this uh, is perhaps too heuristic, so kind of one step uh, towards being more phenomenological is uh, to ask what is believed to be the origin of subdiffusion in such disordered system, and that is the presence of rare 
insulating regions in otherwise kind of thermalizing environment. And kind of the standard argument goes as follows. So these distributions are exponentially rare in length L and have an exponentially small conductance. So this, they, the conductances of those insulating regions are, um, are distributed uh, algebraically here with the power uh, which when alpha is larger than one, it, it, the system is, diffuses, is diffusive and when it's between zero and one, it's subdiffusive. And this can be also generalized to higher dimensions. So uh, kind of by saying that an insulating region of length L in one dimension is exponentially rare in, in this, its volume. But now what's really, so in the presence of coupling to the environment, uh, and to the drive and the phonons, what will happen is that these insulating regions can be short-circuited by the two. So one way to model is it just to add an ohmic term to the otherwise insulating part of the conductances. And now uh, again, repeat the calculation for this continuity equation and calculate the steady state di distribution of temperatures where conductances are drawn uh, as explained above, in the presence of this source and, source and things. And what we get is that in, in one dimension, uh, now if I plot, uh, when I look at the, how this uh, distribution of thermal, uh, of local temperatures vary as a, uh, with the strength of coupling to the environment, uh, I get the following result that here this power uh, is really is one quarter in the diffusive case, but otherwise changes um, uh, varies with the z being proportional to the correlation length. So we see that the, the power is changing here. While in, in, for example, if I would do the same calculation for two dimensions, where these insulating regions are not believed, I mean, to, to, to lead to, to subdiffusion, because I can kind of go around them, I get that uh, now the temperature variations always behave as epsilon to one half, like shown here. So uh, one point that I can make here is that, I mean, that, that this variation of temperatures, uh, how this variation of temperature depends on the coupling strength to the environment is maybe a new way of how to detect transport properties in a disordered system. But also, I mean, I think it should work also for a homogeneous system if I have a spatially dependent coupling to the environment. And yeah, and that's kind of, it's just a, a new way of detecting transport properties. But it's perhaps not most um, experimentally friendly because I mean, only a few experimental techniques can really access this measurement of local temperatures. So, Maybe, of course, an easier way would be to just measure a current in such a disordered system that's coupled to phonons in the presence of a bias. And what we get from this kind of um, phenomenological model is that also the resistance in such a system coupled to phonons should depend in, in such a form, so should depend on the coupling strength to the environment in this, on this, with this particular power, which also encodes the, the transport properties. But I know that uh, it would be much more uh, comfortable for experiments if we show instead of, if we show these quantities, not as a function of coupling strength to the environment, but as a function of the temperature of phonons. Because effectively, coupling strength to phonons is a function of, of uh, their, their temperature. And we are working on kind of converting this to, to essentially as a function of phonon temperature. But um, now let me finally go to uh, a microscopic calculation, which is uh, done using tensor network technique. Uh, so TBD, using TBD, where we uh, essentially look for the steady state of a disordered spin chain in the presence of now coupling to non-thermal baths encoded into uh, Lindblad operators. So it's just, um, I mean, the point is that we believe this should be the same as if we would really couple the system to phonons in a drive. The, the, the only ingredients is that we need is that we open the system and that we drive it. And this happens also if we couple to Markovian baths that break little balance. And what we do is that then we 
kind of we run, uh, so we are interested in the steady state and we obtain this by running the evolution under this uh, Liouvillian. And the property that we are interested in is, is kind of the dependence on this coupling strength to the environment again. Uh, and okay, we choose these Limblad operators, but the, the choice is not important as long as we don't uh, converge to an infinite temperature steady state. And uh, local temperatures are in this case uh, calculated uh, in the following way. So we cannot anymore do this simulation of, of, of a thermal thermometer, but what we do instead is that we calculate the steady state and we calculate a fictitious thermal steady state and then compare their reduced density matrices and essentially minimize the difference between the two. And we see that uh, indeed this quantity is decently small. Uh, it's of course smaller on the ergodic side that, than on the uh, MBL side and increases as we increase the coupling strength to the environment, but it's still kind of not too bad. And, and here is, let's say, the central result. So what I'm plotting here is kind of the variation of temperatures or inverse temperatures, because we're working on rather, at rather high temperatures as a function of coupling strength to the environment. And what we see is that um, are two regimes. So what we, I already uh, addressed during uh, kind of previous parts of the talk, so from the analytical calculation, we expect this non-analytic behavior with respect to this epsilon with a power that will tell me how the dynamical exponent behaves on the ergodic side, uh, while we see just a simple um, Taylor expansion on the MBL side. And uh, kind of these extrapolations of taking the uh, coupling strengths uh, to the environment to zero are essentially what we, what we expect. So it's zero on the ergodic side and order one on the MBL side. And why we see just a Taylor expansion on the MBL side is because there are no hydrodynamic modes that we would be sort of getting out with our coupling to the environment. And so here, so that's the message essentially by tuning this epsilon, uh, the tuning the coupling to the environment to the drive, we can learn about the, the phase transition that happens at, at vanishing epsilon. And by looking when the kind of the nature of this function changes, we can put at least the lower bound onto the critical disorder strength uh, for the transition. Um, while if we kind of do some fitting uh, here on the undergodic side, we can extract the behavior of the dynamical exponent. And what we see is that indeed it grows as system gets subdiffusive as I increase the disorder strength. Um, and so uh, one possibility is that it um, grows uh, uh, algebra algebraically. So, uh, and that's what we try to extract here. So in order to extract the critical exponent and we can do so sort of reliably uh, at smaller disorders while we see a situation at larger disorders where we would essentially need to go to much weaker um, coupling strength to the environment to reliably fit uh, in this region. Um, yeah, but even so, even so the, the result is interesting because if I now compare different methods, in particular results that have been obtained with exact dynamization, I see quite uh, striking uh, differences. So while our critical exponent is very large and uh, obeys uh, Harris bound, it is actually, it's much larger than the one that uh, would be obtained from exact dynamization, which essentially also uh, does not obey this bound. It's kind of close to, an, to older RG results um, and so big that it essentially cannot be distinguished from the newer results, which predict that the correlation length is, is diverging and that the transition is of uh, costelitz taulis type. Um, and um, we also the critical disorder strength that we obtain is much larger than what has been predicted for the same model 
uh, using exaggerization, and it's even in our case only the kind of lower bound that we can get from our numerics. Um, so this is goes in, along the lines of the latest criticism that exaggerization for sure underestimates the critical disorder. And um, somehow from the numerical point of view, the obvious so limitation of our current approaches that we are using uh, this propagation to get to the steady state. So we are need longer and longer times if we want to kind of extract properties at a weaker and weaker coupling to the environment where things are actually interesting. So it's interesting to ask whether it would be better to use some variational approaches. It's not clear this will work out because this can fail at the vanishing of the gap, which is in our case, Ludwigian gap. So that's not so clear, but it's uh, still interesting to ask whether bond dimension is really uh, a limitation in our case because um, on the MVL side, I, I expect a long uh, kind of localized uh, steady state. So bond dimension is low anyway, while also on the ergodic side, I know that the expansion point is around the thermal state that I can represent efficiently with a finite bond dimension if this beta is large enough. And we are sort of thinking whether we can smartly represent the, um, the deviation or the corrections around this expansion point efficiently uh, using other tensor network approaches and essentially kind of go closer to the transition. Uh, and yeah, it remains an open question whether we can do, I mean, we stabilize this highly non-thermal uh, steady state and, and it, it's curious to ask whether we can do something useful with it and we've not fully uh, address this question yet, but there is a, a different setup that I'll just mention in, in two mis minutes, where I know that the same principle gives very, um, very useful steady states. And the idea is again to use this greenhouse principle, um, where I know that where, for example, sun can stabilize very high energy densities because energy is an approximate conservation norm. Now, um, it turned, so since uh, Heisenberg, in Heisenberg model, heat and spin currents are a conservation law and approximate conservation law, it would be very interesting to kind of weakly pump uh, spin chains that are approximately described by Heisenberg model. And we expect that even in the presence of coupling to the environment, which will weakly break those conservation laws, a weak drive can stabilize large heat and spin currents kind of in analogy to large uh, energy densities here. And we've shown that this is indeed the case. You can imply in essentially infinitesimal driving, but if you wait long enough, you, will you can stabilize steady states with order one currents. So current is not proportional to the strength of your drive, which is kind of, I mean, usually always the case. And since I have not, I don't have such a great overview of materials, I'll like to flesh out what are the necessary ingredients for the material uh, that could realize this. So of course we would naturally have coupling to a, a thermal phonon bath, but the driving uh, that would stabilize, for example, this heat and spin currents would be the following, which should, um, happen in, in materials that show staggered G tensor and staggered uh, exchange coupling um, like here. And so if anyone has seen such a material with, as I said, two properties of staggered G tensors and, and staggered exchange coupling upon uh, in, uh, applying an electric field, I would be very much curious to uh, hear about it. But otherwise, let me just conclude. Um, so I've uh, shown that we've introduced a new numerical approach to study the MBL transition and new experimentally relevant order parameter that allows us to kind of study the transport properties as well as the critical disorder strength of the transition. And we hope to push it forward and uh, understand better 
this uh, at least numerically uh, elusive uh, phase transition. So I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators in Cologne, Ori Alberton and Ahim Roche, and Ehud Altman in Berkeley, and organizers for inviting me here and you for your time. Questions from the audience? Yeah. Are there other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is what are the problems of exact organization and that what is the reason that we see such uh, striking um, um, differences. So I think that um, exact organization is, seems like really obviously polluted by, by finite size effects, which kind of um, imprint uh, the problems onto the eigenstates and, and uh, eigenspectra. And the other order parameters were typically literally obtained from, for example, uh, eigenspectra. In our case, where we have coupling to the environment, this problem is gone because essentially coupling to the environment is effectively broadening your eigenstates. So, so this limitation is not present. And uh, therefore we are kind of, we can go beyond um, this wall and somehow at least at finite epsilon model more thermodynamic uh, properties. So by doing what you shouldn't, coupling to the environment, you're overcoming the problems that are there if you have closed system. I, I have a question, a continuation of that. Uh, it, does that refer also to the exact analyzation which is based on stochastic lanthros, like for example, many people in Ljubljana do to study transport? Because there one has the feeling that it, it, it's somewhat coupled to some internal bath, right? because the stochasticity tend to generate some dissipation. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, it's always difficult to go reliable, to see the subdiffusion reliably. And to some extent, we are also uh, having this problem here because we would need, as the system becomes um, kind of uh, slower and slower, we would need weaker coupling to the environment. So, but yeah, maybe you're right that this particular um, problem might be better uh, doing the land. Yes. Okay, so there's a question from the Meadows. So is it on your screen? Yeah. Okay. Tell me, Martin. Yeah, <clears throat> that's probably a stupid question. But you mentioned that it might be a good idea to make this local Raman measurement of the temperature variations in the material. But this is a Raman, if this is Raman phonons, I mean, this would require that the phonons are also localized. So, would, because you're measuring, you're measuring another subsystem. So could it be that the phonons are basically still like delocalized while the other subsystem is in the localized phase? I mean, I think that, well, the, I think having delocalized phonons is not an issue. So you can, I mean, it's fine if, well, if, if let's say, if you have other phonons which are delocalized and they are the biggest troublemakers, these are sort of the ones that we are taking into account. So it is local Raman measurements. We sort of take maybe something like, like this tip enhanced uh, um, Raman measurements that Dmitri Basso is doing so that essentially you have a, a tip and then you're trying to, to make this uh, measurement local. And I guess the idea is that this probably, the measurement itself should be essentially even weaker than the coupling to your maybe true phonons in order to, to access the, or to, to not modify too much uh, your steady state with your measurement. Mm -hmm. which might include this local phonon, but you're sort of assuming that you have also some non-local phonons, which are the ones that are taking into account the, the delocalization that we are mm -hmm. modeling here. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so with this, let's thank the speaker for a really beautiful talk.